Check mic check one two three. Good morning. Good morning, brother. All right, thank you. begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this new day and we thank you for keeping us alive and in good health and in a sound mind that we can study the scriptures together. And uh, we thank you so much for preserving your words and for giving us to them in the King James Bible. And thank you so much, Lord, for the Holy Spirit who helps us to understand and uh, uh, apply the scriptures. We pray that this Bible study would be a blessing to your people and we pray that you would be glorified through it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, last week we had begun studying about an overview of the end times and we started with the rapture of the church. And I've said that the doctrine of the rapture is not an isolated thing connected only to the church, but the Bible teaches seven different raptures. We have seen the rapture of Enoch, rapture of Elijah, Jesus Christ was caught up, Paul was caught up into the third heaven, that's a rapture, and then the fifth one is the rapture of the church. And then even in the tribulation, there are at least two raptures, there is one in the middle, the mid-tribulation rapture, and there is one at the end of the tribulation, which is the post-tribulation rapture. Now, a lot of uh, Christians out of the opinion that the church will go through half the tribulation and then be caught up in the middle of the tribulation. That's called the mid-tribulation rapture view. Then there are some other Christians who believe that the church will go through the entire tribulation and at the end of the tribulation will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's the post-tribulation rapture view. Now these two uh, are right that, that there is a mid-tribulation rapture and a post-tribulation rapture, but they are wrong in saying that the church will go through and be raptured. You see, the Bible teaches all three raptures and a post-trib rapture. They fail to rightly divide the word of truth. The pre-trib rapture is for the church. The mid-trib rapture is for the Jews who are represented by uh, the five wise virgins in the parable of ten virgins in Matthew 25. And then at the end of the tribulation, you have a post-tribulation rapture that you will see in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, as well as in uh, uh, chapter uh, 15. So, these are the raptures mentioned in the Bible. Even in Matthew chapter 24 that we are studying, from uh, verse 30 onwards, you will find a rapture mentioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that would be, again, the post-tribulation rapture. So, the Bible clearly teaches seven different raptures and two even in the tribulation. So there are really three raptures coming. One, the rapture of the church, the body of Christ will be caught up and we will all be gone. Every born again Christian, whether he is uh, living a godly life or whether he is living a backslidden life, it doesn't matter. He will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's the truth of the scriptures. Some over holy Christians, you know, try to make it look like uh, it's not possible for God to rapture backslidden Christians. They think they are most, more holy than God. God has clearly uh, written in the Bible that the church will be caught up. All born again Christians, those who are in Christ will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air at the beginning of the tribulation. But the thing is, in this Laodicean church age that we are living in, in these very, very last days that we are living in, before the church is caught up, the condition of the church and the world would be very terrible according to what we have read in Matthew 24 and in other uh, parts of the Bible like in the writings of Paul. There would be apostasy and we are seeing this apostasy 
like spreading like a tidal wave over the whole world. Terrible apostasy. Lukewarm church. And that's exactly what the condition of the church is today throughout the world. It is a lukewarm church. Like the Laodicean church. Sin and wickedness are increasing. And Paul said that it would be so. And Jesus also said this is how it would be. Iniquity will increase and the love of many will wax cold, he said. Then deception. And that is something that we can see very clearly among Christians today and even among the non-Christians as well. A great deception. A great delusion shall come in the tribulation upon the Jews and the people of the world. But that delusion looks like has already begun begun and there is a terrible deception and then persecution yes before the church is raptured it will go through persecution and you can see how things are changing throughout the world the situation has changed and people are becoming more and more antagonistic towards christianity and christians they are hating christians even more than ever before and here uh, even here in india there is so much of persecution of Christians, but it is suppressed, of course, so that it doesn't come out in the news. Pastors are being beaten and killed and church buildings are being burned down. Bibles are being burned down. Tracts are being burned down. Christians are being beaten up and thrown out of villages sometimes. Persecution is certainly increasing, not only here in India, but everywhere in the world. Even in a place like the United States of America, we see that Christians are being persecuted. That's a sure sign that we are very close to the rapture of the church. So all the things that the Bible says would happen before the rapture of the church are already taking place. Brethren, we are very close to the rapture. Very, very close. And therefore, we need to be ready to meet the Lord in the air. So once the church is raptured, as we have seen last week in uh, Matthew chapter 24, <coughs> uh, Till verse 14 we have seen is the beginning of sorrows Matthew 24 uh, we started from verse 4 4 to 14 is the beginning of sorrows that's the first three and a half years of the tribulation the first three and a half years of the tribulation and in this time in the beginning of sorrows we have seen that again there would be great deception a delusion and in revelation chapter 6 this is represented by the white horse and the white horse rider deception we have seen how the antichrist the white horse rider by the way is the antichrist it is not jesus christ it is the antichrist a lot of Christians think that because in, uh, in Revelation 19, Jesus Christ comes back on a white horse, the rider of the white horse in Revelation 6 is also Jesus Christ. No, it is not. These amillennialists think that Jesus Christ is going to go and conquer the whole world with the gospel, which is blatant ignorance of the word of God. That's what it is. Amillennialists are blind, really blind, and they cannot understand scripture at all. And they are very, very wrong. The white horse rider is the Antichrist and he comes with deception. He comes with peace and he offers peace, especially to Israel, as we have seen in Daniel chapter 9. And then there would be war and that's represented by the red horse rider. There would be famine that's represented by the black horse. Then there would be pestilences and earthquakes and all other things, which is represented by the pale horse or death. So. The Bible very clear, uh, clearly gives us an outline of the things that are going to take place. Firstly, things that are going to take place now before the church is raptured. Then in the first part of the tribulation. And then Jesus Christ goes to the second part of the tribulation, which is called the Great Tribulation. Great Tribulation. That's how... Uh, Jesus divides these two, two parts. The first part is called the beginning of sorrows and the second part is called the great tribulation. We have seen also that in this tribulation period, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. 
not the gospel of the grace of God that we preach here in the church age, the gospel that was revealed to the apostle to the Gentiles, the apostle Paul. Now, I want you to understand something. I am not a hyper dispensationalist. Okay, I do not believe that only the, uh, the, the epistles of Paul uh, should be read and studied by Christians today. I believe the whole Bible is for the Christian. But remember always that there are three applications to every verse in the Bible. There is a doctrinal, app a historical application, a doctrinal application and a spiritual or devotional application. Spiritually, you can apply the entire Bible to the Christian. And every doctrine in the Bible that agrees with the writings of Paul should be applied doctrinally to the Christian. But that which does not uh, agree with what Paul has written cannot be doctrinally applied to the Christian in the church age. But it can be spiritually applied to us. There are a lot of pastors today who are confused between a dispensationalist who rightly divides the word of truth and a hyper dispensationalist who chops up the word of God. They are not able to see the difference. They think when we say that the gospel of the grace of God that was revealed to Paul uh, is the one that we believe in and preach, they think we are hyper dispensationalists. We are not. We don't believe the church started somewhere in Acts 9 or somewhere else. We don't believe that baptism and the Lord's table are not for the church. We don't believe that. We believe the church started in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. We believe that the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper are for the church. And we believe also that the doctrinal content given to the church is to be found in primarily in the epistles of Paul. But even in the epistles of other apostles, there are things which agree with what Paul has written. So we take all those things and apply them doctrinally to us. So you need to be very careful. There's a thin line between being a dispensationalist who rightly divides the word of truth and a hyper, uh, a hyper dispensationalist uh, you know, who destroys the word of God. You need to be very, very careful about that. So we believe that in the church age, we uh, preach only the gospel of the grace of God as it was revealed to Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. The whole doctrine concerning the church was revealed to Paul. Not to Peter. Okay, Peter learned from the writings of Paul. Yes, Peter also uh, learned a few things before Paul started writing his letters. It was not like he was completely ignorant or completely uh, in the dark about it. There were a few things that he learned. But the major things about the church and church age doctrine were revealed to Paul. You must make note of that. And that's why studying Romans to Philemon and applying them doctrinally or building a framework is very important. This framework for us, a doctrinal framework, is built based on the writings of the Apostle Paul. Then we try and fit in everything that fits in into this framework. And with this we apply doctrinally. But that which does not fit into this framework, we apply spiritually to us uh, or devotionally as Christians. Okay, having said that, let us uh, talk about this. The, the, the gospel that is preached in the tribulation is the gospel of the kingdom. The same gospel that was preached by John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ. It was an offering of the kingdom to the Jews. If they would trust their Messiah, Jesus Christ, then he would establish the kingdom. Now, this uh, would give rise to a question. The question is, what if the Jews had accepted Jesus Christ at the first coming, what would have happened? Would Jesus have still died on the cross? Yes, because the Old Testament prophesied his death. He would have still died on the cross, but he would have established his kingdom at his resurrection. That would what would have happened. But you see, that didn't happen. So God gave them another chance in the book of Acts and in Acts 2 you find Peter once again asking Israel to repent of their sin of crucifying their Messiah so that when the times of refreshing come, they would all be accepted and the kingdom would be established. So it's all an offering of the kingdom and that's what will happen once again in the tribulation. They would preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Like Paul says, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. But the kingdom of heaven is the literal 
Davidic kingdom that would be established on the earth at the second coming of Jesus Christ. All right, having said all these things, let us move forward and see what Jesus said would happen in this period of time called the Great Tribulation. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 24 and we will read verse 15. Matthew 24 verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Okay, now Jesus Christ talks about this thing called the abomination of desolation. Now this is exactly at the midpoint of the tribulation after three and a half years. Remember the first part is three and a half years and the second part is also three and a half years. But if you read in the book of Daniel, there are other time periods given uh, that, you know, you need to take into, um, into consideration. So the tribulation is seven years, but there are things that happen even after that. But we don't have the time to look into that in this particular Bible study. You can do a study of your own and see what those extra days are that are added to the tribulation. All right. So in verse 15, Jesus talks about the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet abomination of desolation or the abomination that causes desolation of course this desolation has to do with Israel Jerusalem and the temple <coughs> and Jesus says this abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet will stand in the holy place. The holy place would be a direct reference to the temple in Jerusalem. So the thing that you must understand is that in the tribulation, probably in the first part of the tribulation, the Antichrist would allow the Jews to build a temple on the temple mount in Jerusalem, where the mosque is today. Probably they would destroy the mosque or it would uh, be destroyed in a natural calamity. I don't know what's going to happen. Or maybe the mosque would remain and they would build a temple beside it. I don't know. But there will be a temple in the tribulation. And we know that the Jews are ready with everything for them to build the temple. They have all the things related to temple worship ready. They're all ready. They also have, they say, a heifer which they, uh, you know, which is without spot or blemish, which they would like to sacrifice at the dedication of the temple. So all these things are taking place, which again are a sign that we are very close to the rapture of the church. But the abomination of desolation would be standing in the holy place in the temple. So that means the temple would be rebuilt in the tribulation. Now look at what Daniel says about this in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13 and then we'll also look at Daniel chapter 11 but firstly let's look at Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13 then I heard one saint speaking and another and another saint said unto the uh, that certain saint which spake how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. So it's very clear that in the tribulation, the sanctuary would be there and the sanctuary and the daily sacrifice would also be instituted and that would be trodden underfoot by the Antichrist. So the beginning of the abomination of desolation or the transgression of desolation is to stop the daily sacrifice of animals in the temple. And of course, Paul clearly tells us what else happens there? We will look at that. But in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 31, it says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, there are a few things I want you to understand about the abomination of desolation. The first thing is that they take away the daily sacrifice the daily uh, 
the daily sacrifice is taken away and instead of that they would place the abomination that make it desolate probably the antichrist and also an image of the antichrist but that's not all look at second thessalonians chapter 2 second thessalonians chapter 2 and we'll read uh, verses 3 and 4 let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God so the Antichrist himself is the abomination that uh, causes desolation. So the daily sacrifice is taken away. The Antichrist sits in the temple and says, I am God, worship me. But there is something else. It's, it doesn't end there. That's not uh, the abomination. It's not the complete abomination. There's one more part to this abomination. Now we know in history that uh, uh, Antiochus, sacrificed a pig in the holy place or in or, or in the temple and that they say is the great abomination that causes desolation it's not there is something far worse than offering a pig in the temple and that would be the abomination look at isaiah chapter 6 isaiah chapter 6 and verse 13 isaiah 6 13 it says but yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten, as a teal tree, and as an oak, whose substance is in them, when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Now, the, we, won't have, we don't have the time to go into detail about this abomination of desolation. It's only an overview of the end times. But I want to say that the abomination, a part of this abomination of desolation, is cannibalism. is cannibalism and this verse clearly says that they shall be eaten a tenth so this cannibalism would be like a tithe of the Jews 10% 10% of the Jews would be eaten uh, if you look at the book of Psalms and a few passages there it's very clear that they would uh, use the Jews as human sacrifices to this God the God of this world the Antichrist that is the abomination of desolation and that happens in the middle of the tribulation from the middle till the end of the tribulation this is what happens now these things again correspond with the book of revelation now you remember in the book of revelation there are the seven seal judgments uh, let's say let's begin here the beginning of the tribulation seal number one then we have number two, the seal judgment, three and four, which would be the four horsemen. But the fifth seal is in the middle of the tribulation and you see uh, the martyrs under the altar, the martyrs of Jesus Christ under the altar and they are crying out to God saying, how long will you not judge the people of the world and take vengeance upon them for killing us? So from here onwards, it would be the vengeance of God poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth and especially upon the Antichrist and his followers. So the fifth seal in Revelation chapter 6 corresponds to the middle of the tribulation and to the abomination of desolation. Why are the souls of those martyrs under the altar when the fifth seal is open? It's because they have been sacrificed to the Antichrist. And remember what they believe in the Roman Catholic Church. They believe that the, the elements of the Lord's Supper, the, that wafer that they eat, they don't uh, have bread, they eat a wafer. Uh, the wafer and the, the cup of fermented wine that they drink become the real body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, they don't want to serve uh, the wine, the fermented liquor to the church members. So now they have come up with a doctrine which says, the body and the blood are there in the wafer. So they give only the wafer. And they say that it becomes a real body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That is cannibalism. That's what it exactly is. If you're literally eating the body of Christ and literally drinking the body of uh, the blood of Christ, you're a cannibal. And in another Bible study, we have seen what these cannibals are. These are the priests of Baal. And the Roman Catholic priests are really the priests of Baal. They are, ba they are Baal worshippers. Antichrist, Baal, would be on the earth in the tribulation. And Baal worship would be rampant on the earth in those days. And people would offer uh, uh, human sacrifices. You know, the word cannibal comes from khan e baal That means the priests of Baal. So the very word cannibalism is associated with human uh, sacrifices given to Baal. And that's exactly what's going to happen in the tribulation. Human sacrifices given to the Antichrist and his followers probably. And they would drink the blood of the Jews and eat their bodies. The abomination of desolation. And this would happen in, inside uh, the temple. Now, if you do a little bit of study about the giants in the Old Testament, the giants were cannibals. And the giants were the offsprings of fallen angels and human women. And that's what the Antichrist would be. So he would also be a cannibal. So it's very simple to understand. But let's move on because from here onwards, the great tribulation begins and the abomination of desolation is only the beginning of the terrible persecution endured by the Jews. Now let's go back to Matthew 24. But let me just complete this before I do that. You have the five seals that bring you to the middle of the tribulation and then the fifth seal continues till the end of the tribulation and then comes the sixth, uh, the sixth seal uh, seal number six and then the seventh seal is opened uh, and of course the seven trumpet judgments begin there's number seven here the trumpets by the way the trumpet judgments begin in the middle of the tribulation trumpets one two three four five six and of course the seventh one brings the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and according to my understanding of the book of Revelation, the wild judgments would begin probably, okay, I'm not very sure about this, but most probably they begin sometime at the uh, time the post-tribulation rapture takes place and the seals, I'm sorry, not the seals, the wild judgments begin. The seven wild judgments. And uh, between the post-tribulation rapture and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And the reason why I say that is because in Revelation 14, you have a rapture. Jesus Christ comes with a sickle and he reaps the earth. And then in chapter 15, you find those who are raptured in the third heaven standing before the throne of God. And in chapter 16, you have uh, the seal, uh, sorry, the wild judgments. And it's a very, in one chapter, you have all seven wild judgments so it looks like that's going to be a very short period of time before the second coming and uh, in chapter 17 and 18 of course you have the judgment of the great whore babylon the great and then in chapter 19 the second coming of the lord jesus christ so uh, it looks like this is how it's going to be now to determine or to ascertain the exact chronology of the book of revelation is very difficult if not impossible there are various views held by various great Bible teachers. It's very, very difficult to say this is right and that is wrong. Okay, there could be a variety of combinations in these uh, judgments that are poured out upon the earth. Well, you can prayerfully study it and the Lord will help you uh, to understand as well. But let's go back to Matthew 24 and we'll read verses 16 to 18. Verse 16, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. So again, Jesus is talking about the middle of the tribulation. Remember, he gave us a long list of things that are going to take place in the first part of the tribulation. And he said, these are only the beginning of sorrows. But from now on, you see an increase of intensity in the judgments that are coming upon the earth. So that's why I've also said that the seal judgments take you once throughout 
the tribulation in Revelation chapter 6. You go, you have a full view of the tribulation. It's like an overview really of the entire tribulation. And it takes you to the end of the tribulation and the sixth seal is open and you see uh, that the situation on the earth is exactly how it would be at the second coming of Jesus Christ. But then the trumpet judgments begin probably at the middle of the tribulation and that's why you find uh, uh, an increase in the intensity of judgments that are poured out upon the earth in Matthew 24. So Jesus says from here on things are going to be different. Uh, he says once you see the abomination of desolation stand in the holy place, what should you do? Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Let him flee. But especially in verse 16, he says, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. He doesn't say let them who are in Samaria or Galilee flee into the mountains. The Lord is very specific. Let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. The reason for that is because uh, if they don't, they would be sacrificed. Abomination of desolation. Irrespective of the Jews' uh, religious uh, beliefs, they would be sacrificed to the Antichrist. Whether they believe in Jesus Christ or reject him, they would be sacrificed to the Antichrist. Now that's when the Jews would also realize that this peacemaker is really the devil incarnate. He is not their Messiah and uh, he is not someone who loves the Jews. And they would know it because of the abomination of desolation. So in verses 16 to 18, there is a clear warning to flee, flee Judea. And if you are on the housetop, don't go back into the house to take anything. Run, leave everything. By the way, this brings up an interesting subject. When this happens, when the abomination of desolation takes place and the Jews leave Judea and run away into the wilderness, into the mountains, <coughs> a lot of prophecies of the Old Testament would once again be fulfilled. And a lot of types and pictures in the Old Testament would also have their fulfillment at that time. What am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, the Jews who run away, who flee into the mountains and the wilderness would once again be taken care of by God like he did in the, uh, in the Old Testament when he brought them out of bondage from Egypt. Remember when they were wandering in the wilderness, God gave them water from the rock and manna from heaven and he took care of them and protected them. And that's what's going to happen for three and a half years at least. In the, in the second part of the tribulation. And God's going to take care of them in the wilderness. And most probably, and it seems almost certain to me, that once again he would perform the miracle of giving manna from heaven and water from the rock. And he would protect them for three and a half years. You'll read about these things in the book of Hosea as well. At the end of the three and a half years, Jesus Christ appears to them and many of the Jews get saved. The remnant would get saved and the rest would be destroyed and the remnant would, would return to Jerusalem with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you can do a study, an in-depth study of this subject on your own. It's very, very interesting. Pictures in the Old Testament find their fulfillment in the New Testament. And that's something you need to keep your eyes open to notice every time you read the Old Testament. So in 16 to 18, Jesus says... Flee, flee Jerusalem, flee, uh, flee Judea and run away. Now look at verse 19. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. You can imagine how terrible it would be to have infant children in the tribulation. Now the thing is, all the children, now uh, I don't want to get into the argument about uh, you know, the age of accountability and all that. There is no particular age of accountability. Yes, in the Old Testament, uh, God took young Jewish boys who were about 19, 20 years old into consideration to be numbered among the Jews. But that doesn't say that they reach an age of accountability there. It depends on child to child. It varies from child to child. So once the child knows that he's a sinner and his need for the Savior, he is held accountable. So all such children are caught up in the, church, uh, in, in the rapture of the church. Now I made a video called, Where Do Children Go When They Die? Maybe you can look it up and get a few more details on this subject. But children are caught up in the rapture. Children who are below that so-called age of accountability. They're all caught up and there would be no 
children, no infants certainly on the earth. But infants would be born in the tribulation, in the first part of the tribulation, right? And that's why Jesus particularly is talking about those infant babes. He says, uh, want them that give suck in those days. Want to them that are with child. If they are pregnant or they, are, they have newborn babies, it's going to be a horrible time for them. Look at Luke chapter 23 and we'll read verse 29. Luke 23, 29. It says, For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. That's how it's going to be, how terrible it's going to be to have children in the second part of the tribulation. They would go through the same tribulation and persecution that the elders would go through. And you can imagine the plight of parents. If they have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior, they would not uh, be allowed to buy or sell without having the mark of the beast or the number of the beast or the number of his name which would be again, of course, 666, which begins at the middle of the tribulation. And uh, the father would not be able to buy food for his children. Can you imagine how terrible it's going to be? Can you imagine the temptation the parents would have to go and take the mark of the beast so that they could give food to the children? That's why, brethren, we need to be out of this world before those terrible days come upon the earth. I don't want to be there at all. Praise God, I'm going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air very soon, the Lord willing. I praise God for that. But, you know, when you think about these things, your heart breaks. How horrible it's going to be for those who have children and infants or for pregnant women in the tribulation. They would most probably starve to death. They might even have to engage in cannibalism. That's how it's going to be. But we move on. In verse in verse 20 of Matthew 24, it says, But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. He says, when you have to flee Jerusalem and Judea to uh, escape from the abomination of desolation, just pray that your flight would not be on a Sabbath day. The reason for that is very simple. On Sabbath days in Israel, everything is closed down. You won't find transportation. The planes won't fly. Probably the flight there is a reference to airplanes because the Bible is prophetic, you know, and the King James Bible has advanced revelation in it. So I won't rule that out at all. But he says, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Winter, it's very cold. And even if they escape into the mountains, they would die of hunger. Uh, they would die of a cold, probably. That's why he says, pray that your flight be not in winter. And then neither on the Sabbath day. You won't be able to go very far on the Sabbath day. Because there won't be any transportation. Verses 21 and 22. For then shall be great tribulation. That's where we get the words great tribulation. For this part of the tribulation. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Never was there such a tribulation ever, till you come to the middle of the seven year period of tribulation. Then begins the great tribulation. And then in verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, uh, most Christians assume the term elect here is a reference to Calvin's election. In Ephesians uh, chapter 1 verses 3 to 11, you find about uh, election, right? Unconditional election is what Calvin taught and Calvinism teaches. Now, that's not the elect that uh, Jesus Christ is talking about here. The elect are very clearly found in the Bible. Look at Isaiah chapter 45, Isaiah 45 and verse 4, Isaiah 45 and verse 4, for Jacob my servant's sake and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name, I have surnamed thee though thou hast not known me. Here he's talking about Cyrus but look at how he addresses Israel, Israel mine elect, so the, for the elect's sake. 
this time period is shortened it's going to be three and a half years but it may be less than three and a half years because firstly there is a, a post-tribulation rapture and then Jesus Christ seems to appear once before the second coming to the Jews who are hiding in the wilderness now that's again another subject for you to study on your own there is a probability that that might happen and you will see that in uh, Song of Solomon especially in chapter 2 all right so once uh, the, the abomination of desolation begins it's only going to become more and more difficult for Israel to survive remember that Israel is the physical part of the kingdom of God the literal kingdom of God is the kingdom of Israel and the devil wants the kingdom of heaven the literal physical Davidic kingdom that is what the devil covets he doesn't covet the spiritual kingdom the kingdom of God he has his own spiritual kingdom the Roman Catholic Church but the devil wants the whole world to be his own yes he is the God of this world but he knows that he's on borrowed time he would like to defeat God and the Lord Jesus Christ and establish his own kingdom on the earth forever well he's given a chance for seven years to rule this world he appoints his own king the Antichrist to rule the earth but then at the second coming of Jesus Christ he is destroyed from Matthew 23 onwards we begin looking at the second coming of Jesus Christ so before we start looking at that part of Matthew 24 let me once again clearly show you that the tribulation lasting seven years is divided into two parts now I have also taught earlier that the tribulation could be 10 years which I still believe that there is a possibility there is a possibility that there are three years before the actual seven year period tribulation begins after the rapture of the church now I'm not teaching this dogmatically but I believe there is a possibility that there would be three years before the seven year period tribulation begins and probably in those three years they would build the temple of uh, Jerusalem now I could be wrong about this but uh, it's something again very interesting to study in the scriptures so the tribulation is for seven years the first three and a half years have the four seals the four horsemen and the judgments that Jesus Christ spoke about in Matthew 24 and these are the beginning of sorrows but then in after the mid tribulation rapture begins the actual great tribulation and it begins with the abomination of desolation which is the taking away of the daily sacrifice it's the Antichrist sitting in uh, the temple and saying he's God and demands to be worshipped and then cannibalism practiced by the Antichrist in the temple of God and that's how the great tribulation begins and then Jesus says once you see this you run away from Judea you flee into the mountains because there'll be such a great tribulation in those days as the world has never seen before and he says for the elect's sake this time period is shortened so probably it'll they'll go through this only for three years most probably and then there would be the, the post tribulation rapture that is for the elect and the elect are Israel there's one more thing that uh, I want you to make note of which Jesus Christ doesn't talk about in Matthew 24 but you'll find it in Revelation look at Revelation chapter 11 Revelation chapter 11 and verse 3 and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth so this is something that Jesus Christ did not mention but uh, the two witnesses the two witnesses are not Enoch and Elijah they are Moses and Elijah they are Moses and Elijah it's very very clear by the signs they perform uh, in Revelation chapter 11 some people say it is Enoch because Enoch didn't die he was raptured he's going to come back and die they want to make sure Enoch dies I don't know why they hate him so much Enoch's not going to come back Enoch's not going to die because he's a type of the living 
Christians who will be raptured and they will never come back to die again. So Enoch is a type of born again Christians who are living at the time of the rapture. So they, he's not going to come back. God will not destroy a type. Then it would be Moses and Elijah and they would uh, preach, they would prophesy, they would perform great miracles. And of course you have the 144,000 Jews. They are not Jehovah's Witnesses. These are 144,000 Jewish male virgins. They are Jewish male virgins. And they are there in the tribulation preaching probably the gospel of the kingdom supported by the ministry of Moses and Elijah. And that's how they attack the Antichrist and the kingdom of the Antichrist. The two witnesses begin their ministry sometime just before the middle of the tribulation and sometime just before the second coming of Jesus Christ, they are martyred, they are killed by the Antichrist. Of course, they are caught up at the post-tribulation rapture. And we know that they begin their ministry just before the middle of the tribulation because their ministry is three and a half years in Revelation chapter 11. And they are killed before the second coming of Jesus Christ. So that means they don't begin in the middle and go till the end. They begin sometime before the middle of the tribulation and end uh, and die sometime before the end of the tribulation. So you have the 144,000 Jews and the two witnesses preaching in the tribulation period. Another thing, uh, well, let, let's go to Matthew 24 and look at certain things there. Let's look at Matthew 24. We'll read verses 23 and 24. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. We'll read verses 25 and 26 as well. Uh, Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Remember what I said. I said to you earlier that the Jews will flee into the mountains and into the wilderness. Probably they will be hiding in Sila Petra and uh, in Jordan. And <coughs> them with manna from heaven and water from the rock. But the Antichrist, for some reason, would not be able to reach them. God puts a hedge around them. He doesn't allow the Antichrist to destroy them. Remember in Revelation 12, the great red dragon persecutes the woman and the woman is Israel and she flees into the wilderness and he opens his mouth and a flood of water goes to destroy the woman. But what does God do? He causes the earth to open up and swallow the water so that the water doesn't hurt the woman in Revelation chapter 12. So we understand that God protects Israel in the second part in the wilderness, just like he did in the Old Testament under Moses. Moses will be there again, so the Israelites will also be there in the wilderness. And the devil would try, or the Antichrist would try various ways of destroying those Jews being protected by God. He would probably send in some messengers who would say, look, Christ has come. He's there in the desert. He says, do not go because they're waiting to kill you there. They would say, there he is in the secret chambers. Don't go there. They're waiting to kill you. You just be where I have put you. All right, so that's what is going to happen in the tribulation. And like I've said, in all probability, the Jews would be hiding in Sila Petra. And there's a lot of references to that in the Old Testament, which will be a very good study for you to engage in. Uh, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll read verses 8 and 9. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says here in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 and 9, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. That's another thing that would be characteristic of this time period. Power, the Antichrist's power, uh, signs and wonders, What's uh, power, signs and lying wonders. Signs and wonders. 
Does it sound like our charismatic brethren? Yes, it does. Well, the devil has power to do signs and wonders, just like the apostles did. You read about uh, the signs of the apostles in 2 Corinthians 12.12. 12. The apostles could be identified by the signs and wonders they could perform. Not the signs and wonders these charismatic uh, preachers perform. Those are magicians' tricks. That's what they are. But the signs and wonders were with great power when the apostles performed them. And once again in the tribulation, probably through the ministry of the 144,000 Jewish male virgins and Moses and Elijah, there would be again signs and wonders. But uh, even the devil has power to perform signs and wonders. And the tribulation is going to be a time of great signs and lying wonders. The design of those wonders and signs would be to deceive. That's what the devil is doing right now. He gives sometimes power to these charismatic preachers who uh, can, can deceive people with their so-called signs and wonders. The purpose of it all is to deceive. Remember that. Because signs and wonders accomplish nothing for God in this church age. Absolutely nothing. So you need to be careful about that. Now look at Revelation chapter 13 and verse 14. Revelation 13 and verse 14. Uh, we'll, we'll start with verse 13. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So he causes the people of the earth to worship the image of the beast and to take the mark of the beast or the number of the beast or the number of his name. <coughs> uh, that's going to happen also in the second part of the tribulation called the Great Tribulation. Now we come to Matthew chapter 24 and we'll read verses 26 to 28 very quickly. Matthew 24, 26 to 28. We already read 26. We'll read 27 and 28. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will be the eagle. There the eagles be gathered uh, together. So Jesus says that his coming, second coming, would be just like the lightning as it is seen as it lights up the whole heavens. That's how the second coming would be. Now, that's a good uh, mark for you to, un uh, to keep in mind, to differentiate between the rapture and the second coming. At the rapture, he comes secretly. He comes into midair. Only the church, the body of Christ can see him, not the rest of the world. But at the second coming, he comes like lightning. It lights up the whole world. And the whole world would be able to see him coming back. Uh, sometimes, of course, this is mistaken for the rapture of the church. It's not at all talking about the rapture of the church. It's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we will talk a little bit more about the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Lord willing, uh, this coming Sunday. But uh, let's just read one more verse and then close. Look at Luke chapter 17 and verse 24. Luke chapter 17 and verse 24. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under the heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. So the second coming of Jesus Christ would be a public, visible event. The whole world would be able to see it. And as we'll see in the coming, uh, this coming Sunday, the Lord willing, what's going to happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ? What will the world do? How will the world react? What are the events that follow the second coming of Jesus Christ? We're going to look at all those things, an overview of all the things connected to the second advent and to the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I hope and pray that these things would encourage you to study the scriptures more and encourage you to, uh, to begin looking up because your redemption draws near. I'm using those words, of course, figuratively, but I want you to understand that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for the church is very, very close. 
it's right at the door brethren it could happen any any moment Yes, we talk about dates and we talk about years and all that, but the Lord could come right now. He could come right now as even as we are speaking here. We believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ for the church. The Lord has his own dates. The Lord has his own calculation of years. We could all be wrong about it. So the Lord can come at any moment. That's why we must be ready. And we believe the Lord can come at any moment because Everything that the Bible says would happen before the rapture of the church has already taken place. They've been taking place for the past 100 years. 100 years. And that's why we need to be come, uh, ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It means two things. It means firstly that we were going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. To give an account for the things that we have done in our body. For what? For our works. And we will be judged there for our works. We'll be judged as sons, not as sinners. We'll be judged as sons but and as saints. But whether we receive rewards or lose them depends on what we do for Jesus Christ now on this earth. And the second thing I would like to say about the rapture of the church is that it is a called a blessed hope in the Bible. It's a blessed hope. So we are not afraid of the rapture. We are looking. We are looking forward to that glorious appearing of course that's a mention to the second coming but even for us it's a glorious appearing of our god and savior jesus christ we are looking forward to it because our mourning will be turned into uh, laughing our sorrow will be turned into joy when we behold the face of our savior it's going to be a wonderful moment every born again christian should yearn for that moment when he will look at the face of his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what joy it gives uh, in, in waiting for that moment. You know, yes, we, we are impatient, but it also gives us an inexplicable joy. We know that very soon at any moment, we are going to see our Lord Jesus Christ face to face. We're going to leave this earth. We're going to be with him forever. What a blessed hope. Praise God. All right, so... We're going to take a short five minute break and then come back for the sermon. Once again, I'm going to request you to switch off the stream. And then when you get a notification, you click on it and then you'll be able to join us for the live streaming of the sermon. God bless you.